Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Justice P. N. Bhagwati Memorial Lecture on the topic: The Journey of the Supreme Court of India on Fundamental Rights. A very warm welcome to our distinguished guests, cherished colleagues, dear students, and members of the audience who have joined us for this very significant lecture. Today, I'm delighted to welcome Mr. Tushar Mehta. Solicitor General of India, who will be delivering this lecture. I am also so pleased to welcome Professor Dr. C. Rajkumar, Founding Chancellor, O.P. Jindal Global University; Professor Dabiru Sridhar Patnayak, Registrar, O.P. Jindal Global University; Professor Dr. S. G. Srijit, Executive Dean, Jindal Global Law School and Dean, Strategy and Institution Building, O.P. Jindal Global University. And Professor Dr. Kushbu Chauhan, Associate Professor and Associate Dean, Jindal Global Law School. I extend a very warm welcome to those who have joined us via simultaneous broadcast. Before we begin, I invite our distinguished guests to please offer the floral tribute in memory of Justice P. N. Bhagwati and commence the event with the lighting of the lamp. Thank you so much. I invite Professor Dr. C. Rajkumar, Founding Chancellor, O.P. Jindal Global University, to please present the welcome address. A very good morning to all of you. Um, Surabhi twice made the mistake. I am not the Founding Chancellor. I am the Founding Vice Chancellor of the University. Our Chancellor is, of course, our benefactor, Mr. Naveen Jindal, and we do pay enormous gratitude to his vision that brought us all of us here today. Um, today is, of course, a very, very special day. I want to begin by a slight apology for the slight delay in this uh, start. And I have to say that uh, uh, Mr. Toshal Mehta has uh, been so kind to be present here when he has every reason to be in front of the Delhi High Court when there is a very, very important matter uh, that the government is uh, arguing before the court. And he's, of course, giving telephonic instructions uh, on that matter. So uh, deeply grateful for your presence, sir. Um, today, as I mentioned, is a very, very important day in the history of our university and our annual initiative that we have here. We are hosting uh, Mr. Tushar Mehta, the Solicitor General of India, for uh, having accepted to deliver the Justice P. N. Bhagwati Memorial Lecture. Um, Justice Bhagwati does not need any introduction uh, to the world of law, not just in India, but around the world. On a more personal note, I had the privilege to know uh, just Honorable Mr. Justice Bhagwati and his wife, Mrs. Bhagwati, for a very, very long time. Um, from my student days in the 1990s from law faculty, Delhi University, but all through those years when they used to frequent New York and Geneva. But more importantly, when uh, this idea of building the university came uh, to me as a student in Oxford in 98, uh, the, one of the first persons I discussed the idea was uh, Justice Bhagwati, long before I had any plans to actually move to India and do this. And not only Mr. Bhagwati, Justice Bhagwati supported it, 
but uh, galvanized so much of consciousness and there are some early letters and documents and quotations about this what this university will end up become in the future uh, we have those things and i am so privileged that he was part of that early evolution so i want to take this moment to thank honorable mr justice p n bhagwati but also his uh, wife and over the years uh, his daughter pallavi shroff in fact uh, on 11th 12th and 13th of august 2006 when we hosted the first international conference on the theme access to justice law policy and institutions pallavi spoke in that conference again that was the conference which was a prelude to the idea of this university and uh, she uh, supported our endeavor and remains uh, a, a very very active supporter in our endeavor both uh, shadul and pallavi and of course uh, in cyril and uh, others uh, i am also grateful to sonali uh, bhagwati who is the daughter of uh, justice bhagwati who is present here Uh, Sonali makes it a point to be present here at this lecture, so I am deeply grateful to her for taking the time and the effort to be here. I am also grateful to Mr. Tushar Mehta uh, for a number of reasons, but most importantly to recognize the importance of this event and also to accept our invitation to take out time from his busy and hectic schedule in Delhi and to be present here today. Uh, Mr. Tushar Mehta. is uh, one of india's leading lawyers uh, a distinguished uh, advocate uh, a senior counsel but more importantly the solicitor general of india he traverses across uh, many difficult and complex issues in which he defends the government of india and quite ably in an environment where uh, courts are playing an obviously a very central role in the evolution of our own democratic institutions um mr mehta Uh, also has been a great supporter of our institution for a very long time uh, there are numerous situations as an institution we need to deal with and um, i can only say that he has been an ambassador at large for op jindal global university jindal global law school uh, he has never said no to any of our requests he has uh, constantly been a great source of inspiration for me personally uh, for supporting this endeavor he um, it has uh, uh, you know attended several of our events in delhi and it has been uh, quite a while since he last came to our campus and today we are very fortunate that we are hosting him on our campus lastly i want to say that uh, the uh, extraordinary contribution of justice p and bhagwati as a jurist uh, as uh, somebody who has uh, shaped the future of law and jurisprudence has influenced not just india but the entire world uh, but unlike many other judges uh, who have had very good tenures as judges justice bhagwati was one such person who transcended the boundaries of law and justice in india but also was recognized for his contribution in the world he served quite ably in the united nations human rights committee for very many years was responsible for the evolution of national human rights institutions around the world including the idea of nhris Uh, today over 150 countries in the world have established national human rights commissions and justice bhagwati played a very significant role he also contributed to the international commission of jurists he has been a very active uh, member of the united nations system uh, always available to be able to be an independent voice for speaking truth to power not just in india but also around the world he also contributed to the evolution of a number of institutions within india and we pay tribute to him for all of those contributions as well um another thing about justice bhagwati is that he enjoyed uh, interacting interacting with students and faculty he delivered lectures around the world and across india he has a very strong had a sense of academic bent of mind where he was combining the rich tradition of a lawyer a judge a jurist and an academic when he engaged on complex issues of law and policy so we are truly uh, you know grateful uh, to have this opportunity to host this lecture every year and to have uh, another distinguished jurist uh, mr dushar mehta to be able to deliver this lecture thank you very much thank you so much sir i now request professor dr kushboo chohan 
Associate Professor and Associate Dean, Jindal Global Law School, to please share the introductory remarks. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Justice P. N. Bhagwati Memorial Lecture, an occasion where we commemorate the life and legacy of a towering figure of the Indian judiciary. Today, we gather to delve into a theme that resonates deeply with Justice Bhagwati's lifelong commitment to justice and human rights, the journey of the Supreme Court of India in fundamental rights. Throughout its history, the Supreme Court of India has been interested with the solemn duty of upholding the fundamental rights enshrined in the Constitution, ensuring they remain inviolable and sacrosanct. This journey has been marked by numerous milestones, challenges, and triumphs, shaping not only the legal landscape of the nation, but also the fabric of Indian democracy. Justice P. N. Bhagwati, a luminary in the realm of Indian law, played a pivotal role in advancing the cause of fundamental rights during his tenure, both as a judge and the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of India. His visionary judgments and unwavering commitment to justice have left an indelible mark on the jurisprudential landscape of India, inspiring generations of jurists, lawyers, and human rights activists. As we reflect on the journey of the Supreme Court of India on fundamental rights, we are confronted with a myriad of questions and considerations. How has the interpretation of fundamental rights evolved over the years? What landmark cases have shaped the contours of constitutional jurisprudence in India? What challenges lie ahead in safeguarding and expanding the ambit of fundamental rights in an ever-changing society? In this memorial lecture, we are privileged to have Mr. Tushar Mehta, Solicitor General of India, a distinguished speaker who will offer his insights, perspectives, and scholarly reflections on this dynamic theme. It is our fervent hope that through the discourse, we can honor the legacy of Justice P. N. Bhagwati and reaffirm our collective commitment to the ideals of justice, equality, and dignity enshrined in the Constitution of India. Once again, we extend a warm welcome to each of you. We are confident that this lecture will serve as a catalyst for meaningful dialogue and introspection on the journey of the Supreme Court of India in upholding fundamental rights. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Chauhan. I now invite Professor Dr. S. G. Srijit, Executive Dean, Jindal Global Law School, and Dean Strategy and Institution Building, OP Jindal Global University, to share his reflections on Justice P. N. Bhagwati's life and contribution. Good morning to everyone, and welcome to Justice B. N. Bhagwati Memorial Lecture on the theme, The Journey of the Supreme Court of India, uh, on fundamental rights. I'm, I'm truly honored that I've been chosen to speak about the life and contributions of Justice P. N. Bhagwati. Generally, I get to give the introductory remarks, so this has been a sweet departure. Let me start by tearing out a page from fiction, a novel by Anand with the title, The Tales of Govardhan. You might have all heard about the popular drama Andheri Nagari Chopad Raja by Bardentu Harishchandra. At the end of the novel, Govardhan, the protagonist, gets hanged for the simple reason that he happened to have a slender neck. Anand in the novel, Govardhan's travel comes to liberate Govardhan from the death sentence and let him be free. He goes across historical timescales, transcending times, wandering like a vagabond, asking the question, what was my crime? My crime was that I happened to have a slender neck. I wanted an answer for the question, why was injustice meted out to me? I wish he met Justice Bhagwati. Because in the novel, he meets Amir Khosru, he meets Kalidasa, he meets Gandhi, and he's asking the question, or he asks the question, why? What was my crime? Why justice was denied to me? I wish he met Justice Bhagwati, because Justice Bhagwati was a voice of the voiceless. He was a representative of the unrepresented. And for that sole reason, I believe uh, this tale of Govardhan deserves mention here. Justice Bhagwati was a self-perfecting man. A self-perfecting man is the one who's in a constant pursuit of one's own beingness. 
he never hesitated to regret. He never hesitated to, apo hesitated to apologize. He regretted for his judgment in ADM Jabalpur and he used this beautiful expression, I plead guilty. I plead guilty for an act of weakness. He gave an interview in 2013 in which he was candid enough to say that. It takes courage to plead guilty. When you sense that you have been part of a collective wrong, not an individual wrong, but you have been part of a collective wrong which the Supreme Court of India at that point committed. And subsequently, Supreme Court too corrected itself for all the mistakes it did in ADM Jabalpur, subsequently in Ramdeo Chauhan versus uh, Bani Kandas in 2010. He believed that Supreme Court could have acted better during the days of emergency. The guilt was so profound, so profound in his mind, because you know why? Because he felt that ADM Jabalpur denied life to an individual, a life that was already well-defined by the Supreme Court. Had it been a life which was not well-defined, he would not have felt this profound sense of guilt. But Supreme Court denied a life which it itself built through many of its judgments. He never dictated any judgments. Uh, I would say this is a great, uh, great act because when you don't dictate the judgment, you feel the text. The feel between the text and the text maker can often let the emotions to pour down in the judgment. When he wrote, ink became the liquefaction of emotions. And of course, you know that this is not like an overstatement because we have heard about this expression, emotional liquefications. So he wanted to feel that relationship between the text and the text maker, so he never detected his judgments. As I mentioned, the self-correcting of the Supreme Court and Justice Bhagwati, there's a relationship between both. Emergency gave the court a great awakening about its own limitations. For the first time, the Supreme Court thought that all the claims about the judicial supremacy, which it had developed over the, uh, over, over the couple of decades, were all wrong. Uh, the subsequent willing, of, willing and acting of the court, the willing and acting subsequent to the emergency was out of the sheer guilt of the court. The court went on to reclaim its glory, and Justice Bhagwati played a big role in reclaiming this glory of the Supreme Court past emergency, and Supreme Court rose like a phoenix through the ashes, or from the ashes, through Article 14 and Article 21, and Supreme Court would witness, or rather India would witness, extraordinary decisions coming from the Supreme Court uh, through, uh, through Article 14 and Article 21, and Justice Bhagwati was instrumental in that. He always used this expression, I molded the law after the emergency. I got an opportunity to mold the law. He repeatedly used this expression, molding, and that's exactly what Justice Bhagwati did. So he played a remarkable role in rebuilding this. Now this rebuilding has something sweet about it. Uh, there is a novel by Italo Calvino with the title Invisible Cities, in which he speaks about a city called the Clarice. Clarice has a rare quality that after every century, Clarice will go into dissolution, an absolute decay, and from there it will resurface again as a better state yet it will retain or it will become an unparalleled model of its old glory. That's exactly what happened with the Supreme Court post the emergency. It was not just a reclamation of an old glory. Supreme Court rediscovered itself in the disappointments of emergency through the possibilities of fundamental rights. Particularly looking at Justice Bhagwati, especially the role he played with uh, Justice Krishna here in reshaping the Supreme Court or in reclaiming this glory or in rebuilding the Supreme Court, uh, I've just, I would just summarize this with this expression. He sung the melodic duet of justice along with Justice V.R. Krishna here. I would not speak much about their joint work in the Supreme Court. Some of his judgments, we all know Maneka Gandhi versus Union of India, Hussein Ara Khaton versus State of Bihar, where Life and personal liberties, he mentioned, can be taken away only by the procedure established by law. And that procedure established by the law shall be just, fair, and reasonable. And to this justness, fairness, and reasonability, he added this high values of due process, natural justice, and access to justice. He sowed the seeds of public interest litigation. And that's based on a profound philosophy that Justice Bhagwati had in his mind. He wanted the wrongs to speak the language of the rights. Representation, he believed, is the key to justice. And he really wanted the third party representation for the unrepresented, which he explored through a term which Justice Krishna later on popularized, epistolary jurisdiction. That means deemed it to be writs, 
a letter written to the court will be deemed it to be a writ and the court will take cognizance of the matter. He was in fact deformalizing the justice to take it to the unrepresented, to the simpletons who, leave in the, who lived in the peripheries. On environmental matters, Justice Bhagwati believed in sustainable development. Remember, we are talking about 1984 and 85 and sustainable development is yet to take proper shape. Justice Viramantri is yet to give the judgment in Kapshika Bunajibaro's case where he waxed eloquent on sustainable development. At that point, Justice Bhagwati, through MC Mehta versus Union of India, developed the notion of sustainable development by explaining the act of balancing development with environmental protection. But don't take him for granted. He took a strict stance when development crossed all boundaries of sustainability, as in the Doon Valley case, uh, rural litigation entitlement Kendra Dehradun versus state of UP, where he daringly decided to shut down all the quarries which damaged the, Dune, the beautiful Doon Valley. Subsequently came his landmark decision in Francis Corelli versus Union of India. Of course, this is a case generally we study in the constitutional law case as a case that defined the idea of life, but we look at that Justice Bhagwati's judgment here, you would find that he defined life as facilities for reading, writing, and expressing oneself in diverse forms. He defined life as an opportunity for catharsis, or rather he found self-expression as a means of catharsis. That's exactly what he did in this case. So the sum total of all the rights according to Justice Bhagavati, is the bare minimum expression of the human self. This particular element in Justice Bhagavati's decision was later on used to define dignity in both Nas foundations and in Navtej, Navtej Singh Johar. I always believe that he, uh, in a typical Heideggerian fashion, he was in search of his beingness. He believed that the Dazain, the Heideggerian Dazain in material and historical conditions, all the time is in relentless pursuit of the meanings of life. And Justice Bhagwati became an answer, or rather he gave answers for that big existentialist questions. Who am I? Why am I here? What causality had me doing things? On a lighter note, I could see Justice Bhagwati comfortably sharing a coffee with Jean-Paul Sartre, Simona de Boer, and Malio Ponti in the proverbial existentialist cafe. And that conversation will have no oddity of a jurist's presence there. Lastly, Justice Bhagwati was a scholar par excellence. We, we are familiar with Justice Bhagavati primarily through his judgments. Seldom his academic writings are taken note of. And I found that those academic writings of Justice Bhagavati are afterthoughts of his own judgments. He wanted a little bit of value talk on those judgments which were constrained by constitutional imagination, which did not give much space for the value talks. Uh, and most of these value talks were on themes which were otherwise parts of his own judgment. So he added a new layer of reasoning through his academic writings by taking positions outside the, if I may use this word, elite discursivity of judiciary so that his, his discourse or the judicial discourse could reach the public more easily. He wrote this piece, Human Rights in Criminal Justice System in Journal of the Indian Law Institute in 1985, where he went on to explain or wax eloquent on procedural justice. Another beautiful article uh, with the title Bureaucrats, Phonographers or Creators, which he published in Times of India, he went on to say that one of the primary function of the court is to share the passion of the constitution, something you generally don't get to read in a judgment. And uh, lastly, Justice Bhagwati also wrote a case book on income tax law for the students of the law school. Now what's better to be spoken, up, spoken about in a lecture in memory of Justice Bhagwati than on the fundamental rights. And who's better to speak on the fundamental rights than Mr. Tushar Mehta, who's actually the state's voice in the court, the state which is supposed to be the guarantor of the fundamental rights. It's a perfect match. Everything has fallen in the right time at the right space. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Srijit, for what I can say was the most uh, wonderful virtual tour of Justice Bhagwati's great journey in law and life. Thank you so much. I now welcome Mr. Tushar Mehta, Solicitor General of India, to please deliver the Justice P. N. Bhagwati Memorial Lecture on the topic, The Journey of the Supreme Court of India on Fundamental Rights. Welcome, sir.
good morning friends in fact almost good afternoon uh, the legendary vice chancellor dr rajkumar the graceful lady sonali ji daughter of the legendary justice bhagwati surbi the shrinij as uh, uh, srijit ji patnayak ji and dr kushbu chauhan and my young friends speaking about justice bhagwati is by itself an honor and by organizing a lecture in memory of justice bhagwati we are not honoring justice bhagwati we are honoring ourselves i had an occasion to meet him on quite a few occasions and my feeling after meeting him was that of an inferiority complex you are not impressed by the man only but you feel inferior without any attempts being made by him to make you feel inferior and that's the greatness of the man sonali ji must have seen mr bhagwati and therefore she would possibly not know what justice bhagwati the phenomena the living legend of the time was he was an institution in himself and it's an honor for me to deliver this lecture now coming back to the topic the topic is journey of the supreme court on fundamental rights it's a journey of the supreme court and therefore i would given the constraint of time make the journey a little fast track but at the end of the journey you will find that the journey of the supreme court in the case of fundamental rights have been a constant struggle a constant fight a constant conflict between the majoritarian government and the custodian of the fundamental rights namely the highest court of the country the supreme court of india all of us are aware that our constitution is framed by the constituent assembly how did we get the independence of course i presume all most of you are law students but just for the purpose of record let me say it doesn't happen that lord mountbatten would hand over something to jawaharlal nehru and india would become free everything happens by some statutory enactment and this happened by the indian independence act 1947 it was under that act that india attained independence and became an independent sovereign nation section 8 of that act provided that the constitution would be framed by the constituent assembly constituent assembly was formed by way of an election election took place under the government of india act 1935 but now comes the relevant part under the government of india act 1935 passed by the british parliament the voting rights were available only to tax payers and those who are graduates it was not universal adult franchise and therefore the constituent assembly was elected by only 16% 16% of the total population of independent india we are aware that by and large everything was there under the government of india act 1935 which was the basic foundational framework for the constitution of india but we as a nation were so lucky that our founding fathers and mothers of the constitution were so visionary that they took 3 years almost 3 years to draft one of the most beautiful constitutions in the world taking 
not only good things from the United States Supreme Court, but the latest one was the Supreme Court, the, the Constitution of Japan, which was incorporated a year before our Constitution was adopted. In fact, Article 21 of our Constitution, which is the heart and soul of our Constitution, is bodily lifted from the Constitution of Japan. By and large, the total scheme, the overall scheme of the Constitution of India is based upon the Government of India Act 1935. I'm not saying it's copy-paste or it's adoption, but the basic foundational theme is that. There was only one difference. Under the Government of India Act 1935, there was no chapter of fundamental rights because we, Indians, were subjects and not citizens. Our constitution was making us citizens and we were no longer remaining subjects. Therefore comes the most important part in the constitution, namely the fundamental rights. I'm not going into the details of fundamental rights. It starts from Article 12 and goes on. Article 12 defines fundamental rights would be available against the state. State does not necessarily restrictively mean the central government and the state government. It can mean even government corporations, statutory bodies, universities, etc., etc. The most important article which would be necessary for the purpose of today's lecture is Article 13. If I can request, Article 13 can be shown. I'll not take much time. I am aware of the time constraint, but Article 13. Uh, Surbi, can you just help me? With Article 13. I am technologically challenged. Just read Article 13 1. All laws in force in the territory of India immediately before the commencement of this constitution, insofar as they are inconsistent with the provisions of this part, and this part means chapter three, fundamental rights, shall to the extent of such inconsistency be void. Two is important, and there was a conflict, which I will explain in a very, very uh, nutshell, the state shall not make any law. There is a constitutional embargo, a constitutional mandate, a constitutional injunction. The state shall not make any law which takes away or abridges the rights conferred by this part and any law made in contravention of this clause shall, to the extent of contravention, be void. Meaning thereby, it is a constitutional declaration that first, 